and welcome back to another lore video. I am Silvermont or Alex, and before I get onto the main topic today, I just want to clarify something from the Solaire video from last week. I mentioned Griggs in it, but I wasn't sure if he could go hollow or not. Now, a user known as What Does the Pendant Do left a helpful comment explaining that Griggs does go hollow, something that I didn't actually know. Well, something I wasn't sure about at any rate. I've probably put in over a thousand hours in Dark Souls now, and there's still things I'm finding out, which is pretty crazy. I have a bad habit of not watching other videos or reading wikis and forums as much as I, as much as I should, so I tend to miss a lot of things. The majority of what I am coming up with in, with in these videos is just my own speculation, from having observed and played the game, etc. Either way. A very interesting piece of info that, and uh, so I never really spent that much time with Griggs and Logan because I don't tend to use magic much, not just in Dark Souls but in any game, but Griggs will eventually, once you buy all his stuff, exhaust his dialogue, blah blah blah, he will go to Sen's Fortress and he will go hollow, which is uh, interesting to note but that's not the subject for today so that's enough of that. Today we'll be discussing a character who is surprisingly popular given her very small role in the game, which can be easily missed unless you know just where to find her. If you've not figured it out from the title of the video or the thumbnail, the art of which by the way was done by a good friend of mine, which you can also buy on a t-shirt thingy on some place, I'll link that in the description. Anyway. I'll go ahead and tell you if you haven't figured it out yet. It's Crossbreed Priscilla. Locked away, hidden deep in the painted world of Ariamis, Priscilla is a very interesting character because she raises a multitude of questions, yet answers none. So let's start with what we know about her, the facts. There isn't much, but we do know that she's a crossbreed between a dragon and something else, presumably a humanoid given her very human appearance and form. We know that she's half dragon from the descriptions of her dagger, which drops if you manage to cut off her tail. This sword, one of the rare dragon weapons, come, came from the tail of Priscilla, the dragon crossbreed in the painted world of Ariamis. Possessing the power of life hunt, it dances about when wielded in a fashion reminiscent of the white-robed painting guardians. Which leads us nicely into the next point, we know that she is the wielder of an ability known as Life Hunt, so we know that she's a half dragon bastard, and we know that she has the ability of Life Hunt, and we know that she's been locked away in Ariamis. But that is about all we know, and even then we can have some, uh, well there are some discrepancies, if you can call them that, mostly about the last point, her being locked away. Anyway, let's start with some speculation and branch out from these facts, what we do know about her. Her parents. Let's start with the dragon. How many dragons are there in Dark Souls? Well, there's Calamite, Seath, and the Everlasting Dragon, as well as Gaping Dragon and the Undead Dragons. We can probably discount the Undead Dragons and Gaping Dragon, because the former is... yeah, and the latter isn't really a dragon, but rather a descendant, an offshoot. Or rather, I mix that up. The undead dragons are obviously undead, and the gaping dragon is descendant of a, a dragon if you read the descriptions of it. Calamite is probably unlikely to, as we meet him long ago in the past and we kill him then. But, you know, it's possible, it's possible. The most likely candidates, however, are Seath and Everlasting, which is the dragon in Ash Lake. So let's consider the points in favour and against both of them, starting with the weaker candidate, Everlasting. There isn't much to suggest a link between Everlasting and Priscilla, other than the fact that both of them are very fluffy. Indeed, we don't even know if Everlasting is a real dragon. He is considered in-game to be another descendant of the... the dragons that we see in the introduction cutscene, but there's always the possibility that he evolved or was created in such a way that he could continue the dragons and their lineage, so to speak. But we don't know 
about dragons to begin with. They're described as everlasting, eternal, stone, that they don't they don't die, but they're not really alive either. They just seem to be Gwyn and his uh fellows destroyed them, but the game doesn't really make it clear if you actually kill them. See the undead dragons, for example. My small theory is that dragons do not die, but they can be destroyed. So even if you find a scale of a dragon, which you can do in the game, obviously, that scale is still technically alive, if that makes sense. But hey, it's not all that important, but uh, this video will probably be mm, the most concerning uh, dragon lore. Either way, the undead dragon seems to ex uh, not the undead dragon, the everlasting dragon seems to exist to propagate the dragons. What could this have to do with Life Hunt? Um, who could the mother be? Who knows, perhaps nothing? Or perhaps a great deal? But what about Seath, the far more likely candidate? Why? Well, for starters, Seath is an albino dragon with no scales, and that is a large part of his kind of backstory is it's implied the scales are what make the dragons, you know, what they are. Without scales, they're not dragons. It's suggested that he was jealous of the dragons with scales. Seath is white and Priscilla is white, but Priscilla does have some scales, mostly around her neck and forehead, but other than that she mostly seems to be flesh and uh, probably fur, but it's hard to tell whether she's wearing that or if it's actually part of her sort of body. Many of the items with a link to Priscilla make a point of her colouring. There's that, and there's also the fact that Seath, A, has much more contact with humanoid fe females. That sounds kind of messed up, but Seath is messed up, let's face it. B, Seath is known to experiment on a great many things. Maybe a life hunt was something of his own creation, intended to be used against dragons, or maybe even the gods themselves. Who knows? It. I mean, Seath seems to be obsessed with immortality. So, if you want to be immortal, obviously you would have to look up measures that can supposedly kill an immortal. So there's that, yeah. But there's nothing related to Priscilla in the Duke's archives, or vice versa, as far as I'm aware. No shared enemies, no item description links, nothing. One other possibility is that Ariamis is Priscilla's father, an unnamed dragon who can... um, paint. Yeah, that is of course assuming Ariamis is a male name, which I'm assuming it is. We know that Ariamis is a person, as Priscilla mentions them by name during at least one of her um, lines of dialogue. Anyway, on to the question of who Priscilla's mother is, assuming the father was, say, Seath. There aren't many possibilities, but the main two, in my opinion, would be Guinevere and Velka, the goddess. Well, they're both goddesses, but hey, whatever. As with Seath and Eternal, let's look at the arguments for and against both. The Velka first. We don't know much about Velka, other than that she is a god, the goddess of sin. She is described as a black-haired witch who watches over the list of the guilty, those who disrespect the gods or their covenants, and hands out judgement. She has some association with the Blades of the Dark Moon, Interestingly enough, the evidence in favour of Velga being Priscilla's mother is simply that the painted world contains a great many items associated with her. The weapon of her swordsman, along with the black cleric robes, Velka is presumably quite large, being a god, and Pris Priscilla is pretty big herself, so that means the mother would likely have to be large too. But on the other hand, she is referred to on multiple occasions as being black-haired and such. In fact, many of the painted world, uh, sorry, much of the painted world has to do with dark items and themes. For example, the black cleric robes are literally black. There's the dark ember and so forth. How strange to note, given Priscilla's line, this land is peaceful, its inhabitants kind, 
but thou dost not belong. More on that in a moment, though. First, the other candidate for who her mother could be, Guinevere. Now, like with Seath, this has more evidence than with Everlasting and Velka. First up, Guinevere and Priscilla seem to share the same voice actor. That isn't a great link, as a lot of characters do share voice actors. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head, but it is worth noting all the same. Second, Guinevere's illusion is, at least, huge. I mean, her illusion is, so we can assume that she herself is. We can assume the real Guinevere probably looked more or less the same, given the statues we see around Anne Orlando look very much like the illusion, only, obviously, not to scale. Which is interesting, because the statues themselves are much bigger than humans, but the illusion of Guinevere is, like, five times the size of the statues. Next up, Guinevere is explicitly mentioned as being married to Flame God Flan, whomever that may be, and Priscilla is a bastard, which means her parents were not married. Furthermore, not only is the Duke's archives high above Anorlondo and within easy access, relatively speaking, it's almost directly above the cathedral, in which you find the painting itself, which also seems to be Guinevere's cathedral, but we, we don't really know that. The only building we know for sure is the main building with Ornstein in, which is known as Gwyn's Old Keep, but who knows. Oh, we also know obviously the Dark Moon tomb, where Gwyn's tomb is and all that, but this location would put Priscilla close to both of her parents in this case. Another strong link for this is that Seath has performed experiments on Guinevere's maidens and turned them into um, Pisaka. I'm not really sure how that's meant to be pronounced, as they never say it in game, but the weird Cthulhu-esque enemies. Evidence against Seath being the, the father, though? Oh, sorry, no. Ever blah, 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 blah. Evidence against Guinevere being the mother? Well, Gwyn probably would have slapped Seath's shit. That is assuming he didn't condone the actions. It all depends on what Priscilla's purpose is, and when she was born. Why is she in the Painted World to begin with? Has she really been locked away? Does she not want to leave? Has she ever even seen what's on the other side of her fog gate? She seems to be under the impression that the inhabitants are kind, which might suggest that she has been there for such a long time that everyone besides her has turned hollow and insane. Because we don't know if gods themselves can go hollow, other than what we see happen to Gwyn, when you fight him at the end of the game, he does indeed appear to be hollow, but that might be because of A, dividing his soul up so many times, and B, essentially burning himself as, uh, you know, fuel for the bonfire. But maybe as these mm, inhabitants of the Painted World started to go insane, Priscilla was pushed further and further back by those who remained sane and loyal to her, because they may have been guarding her there, it's possible that Guinevere put her in this world. But then again, the item description of the doll would seem to make that less likely. But anyway, let's assume the Hollows were once Priscilla's guards. Some of them started to hollow, and the sane ones retreated, taking Priscilla with them. And the very last one to turn could well have been that Berenique-style knight just outside her gate, who still guards it, despite being hollow. Yet, the description of the strange doll item suggests that she wasn't locked away at all. There was once an abomination who had no place in this world. She clutched this doll tightly, and eventually was drawn into a cold and lonely painted world. That would seem to to discredit the above theory, cold and lonely, seems to imply that it was, it, it's always been as we see it now, so that seems to imply that it hasn't changed sh since she entered it, but you know, it's hard to tell. Why on earth would she talk of others as if it's described as lonely? Why would she call them peaceful? Is she just plain crazy? Who knows? For that matter, why do we find her doll, or doll, in our cell at the start of the game? Well, we don't find it at the start of the game, but we find it in our cell, where you do start. 
the game. The only half answer for that I can provide is that Priscilla was, at one point, intended of being a heroine in the game. In what capacity, we don't know. Could it have been... Could it have had something to do with her life ability being used to defeat the bosses in the game? Very possible. Maybe she was like the demon souls maiden in black in the Nexus, in that you would need her power yourself to power yourself up. You would need her power to defeat the bosses, etc. Maybe she would have even been summoned against the final boss. Wild speculation, ahoy! For those who don't know, in Demon Souls, well, in Dark Souls, when you level up, you go to the bonfire and you feed it souls and you increase your own power. In Demon Souls, you talk to the Maiden in Black and she's all like, touch the thing inside me and blah blah blah. You use her to level yourself up. So it's possible something similar might have been planned with Priscilla and the Life Hunt because in Dark Souls at the moment, we are essentially just a normal undead. Well, we might not be, but, I mean, there's signs for both. We could be the furtive pygmy, we could be the chosen undead, or we could just be a undead. And the title of chosen undead is given to whomever makes it as far as we do. All these options are possible, but operating under the assumption that we are simply an undead warrior who is very skilled, rather like Solaire perhaps, then it would seem a bit weird that somehow we can defeat a god and kill them. Maybe you were supposed to use Priscilla's power of life arm, and that would be the lore explanation for how you could kill Gwendolyn and Gwyn and all these other powerful beings like Nito. But that's just one possibility. Something else to note though, we find the doll in our cell when we go back, and we also find the Black Knights, who seem to be searching for us in the Undead Asylum, and they seem to be killing everything, like all the prisoners in the Undead Asylum. They, um, the Black Knights are in the Asylum, and they seem to be killing all the prisoners, which seems to imply they are searching for us, and we also find the, um, the painted doll thing at the same time, which is very interesting, but uh, who knows. But what is Life Hunt? Presumably it is something that can kill the gods, maybe the dragons, maybe anything. But given that the player can kill the gods too, well, I'll let you consider the implications of that. But Priscilla is quite like the Maiden in Black, but opposite in ways. For example, she's not black, she's very white. <laughs> Both of them have their feet exposed, but whatever. Um, maybe in Dark Souls 2 we'll get some more information on this, as there is an area that looks rather like the painted world in the trailers. We'll just have to wait and see, but I wouldn't hold my breath, as I doubt there will be any much, there will be much in the way of story threads linking Dark Souls 1 and Dark Souls 2. I might be wrong, but I'm under the impression that, although it will be the same universe, there may be, for example, they may mention Astora, they may mention uh, me punching my microphone, they may mention Balder, they may mention uh, the Great Swamp, Kareem, uh, the East, and other places, but I don't think they're going to explicitly say like, oh, do you remember when the Chosen Undead went and punched Gwendolyn? I don't think they're going to mention stuff like that. They might, but I really do not think they will. Then again, it's new directors and we don't know what they're going to do with it. One more thing, one last thing. Priscilla's feet are bare, and her nails are painted pink for some reason. Because Miyazaki likes feet. True facts. Check out the Maiden in Black. There are quite a few connections between the two, even if it's just something as random as their feet. Either way, I think that's about done it for Priscilla and the Painted World. What do you think? Who is Ariamis? Why is Priscilla there? And why does she seem to think that the inhabitants are kind and peaceful, whereas the doll states that it's a cold and lonely world, and it's probably her doll? There's a lot of strange questions, and uh, 
all of this speculation for an area that most players probably missed the first time. I mean, who would think to A, go back to the Undead Asylum, then once they pick up the doll, what would they think with it? I mean, you'd have to be, uh, I suppose it might be quite logical, because it says in the description about the painting, and there's only really one very big painting, but you know, it's uh, it's very interesting. It's not as hard to miss as, say, the Ash Lake. Because there's nothing really in the game that leads you to... Because, I mean, you can go to the painting in the cathedral and you can examine it. And it, I think it says locked by some contraption or something pretty funny like that. Either way, there's a... Uh, I like it, to be honest. And maybe it was just a cut idea which they put into the game because they had the area. Who knows, but uh, Priscilla, either way, is a very interesting character, but uh, that's enough of her.